Our final speaker is Q. Anthony O'Mean. He's an award-nominated uh, writer whose columns appear in McLean's, The Global Mail, and he's the host of the Unredacted podcast with Glenn Greenwald. In addition, he's a board member of the Canadian Association of Black Journalists. He, he, yeah, you can find him on Twitter at QA O'Mean. So Q, go ahead. How's it going? Oh, and, uh, and uh, I appreciate it. Just, well, you know, my, my, uh, my surname is O'Mean. Uh, ah. It's okay. It's okay. You, you didn't know. Um, people have only seen that in, in print. I've only read it. I'm so sorry. I'll know now. <laughs> it's okay. I wouldn't expect people to know that. Um, so the, uh, the, the topic that I, I was actually going to go with a different topic, but um, something just, I don't know, just kept on pressing on my mind um, over the last couple of days. And uh, that was a news article that I read showing that uh, uh, Western Central Africa are becoming increasingly food insecure. And I found that to, on the continent of Africa, I found that to be completely bizarre. Um, and so I wanted to go over a few things and I'm sorry that I don't have something pre-written. I'm, I'm going off of notes that I've, I've made previously. So I hope you'll bear with me. But uh, the idea of West Africa being food insecure was just so preposterous to me that I, I had to, to speak on this one. So this came from an article that I saw uh, saying that uh, the, uh, the, the food crisis in West Africa um, which has apparently been exacerbated by, you know, the conflict in Ukraine, um, has already left 27 million people uh, in West Africa in a state of hunger. Apparently, over the next few months, an additional 11 million people may uh, end up becoming food insecure. Uh, so there was a, an, an NGO report uh, that was published by Oxfam uh, that said between 2007 and 2022, um, the amount of people in need of food assistance in countries like uh, Mali, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, went up from 7 million to 27 million people. And apparently, uh, if there is no emergency action taken, then we know how quickly the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the world, the developed world, springs to action whenever Africa is in need of aid. Um, unless emergency action is taken, the number could rise to 38 million people by June of this year. So the, the, the idea of a country or uh, a set of countries, um, a country like Nigeria or a country like Mali or a country like Chad being food insecure, given the, the quality of the soil, given the types of food that can be produced in those countries, given the types of food that were produced in those countries was amazing to me. And I think what a lot of people don't know is that the future of a sustainable world actually lies in Africa. For example, the most minerally rich country on the face of the planet, not minerally rich country on, in Africa or in the Eastern continents, but in the entire world is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The DRC's untapped reserves for minerals such as uh, cobalt, as everybody knows, uh, cobalt and coltan being those rare earth metals that are increasingly being mined to pull electronics into our cell phones and electronic devices, but also uh, tantalum and gold and copper, etc. The reserves are amount to about $24 trillion. It is the most minerally rich country on the face of the planet. On the entire continent of Africa, there, there is enough potential for food productivity, for, for agriculture, that could feed the world two times over, or sorry, could feed itself two times over and have enough for the rest of the world. Although the amount of arable land on the African continent is relatively small, given the total size of the continent, the types of food that can be produced um, has a, an incredibly wide variety. Uh, the soil is good for everything from, uh, from wheat to cassava, just about anything that you can plant in, in, on any other and any other continent on earth can be planted on the African continent, all of them together at once. Now, here's what uh, bothers me a little bit. When people think of development on the African continent, they often think of things like infrastructure. They think of things like schools and hospitals, and that's good, except most African countries that have been in debt to the IMF, either currently or previously, have been unable to develop their own infrastructure because the initial loans that were taken out from the IMF were often for the purpose of building infrastructure. However, due to the onerous terms of those, uh, those, uh, those repayment conditions, 
oftentimes they find themselves barely able to service the interest on the principal and then have to take out additional loans just to cover the interest, which adds additional interest to it. And then you see how the debt trap works. And in order to qualify for those additional loans to service the interest on the previous loans that were taken out to build infrastructure, oftentimes which didn't get built because in many cases they were built by kleptocratic and, and reactionary regimes that took the power back from the people and took it back from revolutionaries. Um, took out uh, additional loans for uh, for the purpose of infrastructure, but then spent it on themselves, uh, then the IMF, in many cases, ruled out the possibility of building infrastructure with any of those additional loans, and they're there for the purpose of servicing that debt. And what this has led to is a condition where there are relatively few paved roads and railways on the, Af on the African continent, period. So to give an example, the United States has 4 million miles of paved road. The United States, just, just one country. On, uh, in the country of, of South Africa, there are just over 780,000 miles of paved road. That represents 90% of the paved road on the African continent, period. So the United States, 4 million miles in, in total. The entire African continent, less than a million miles of paved road up to today. Here's the, the issue with agriculture on the African continent. One of the reasons why many African countries are food insecure is because there are so few paved roads in the remainder of these countries that are not South Africa, that fully half of the crops that are produced on the entire continent will spoil before they arrive at market. The roads are built to deliver goods from the place of origin, i.e. farms and mines, to ports. They are built for the purpose of moving goods from the resource-rich areas in the, inter in the interior of Africa out to ports where they can be shipped to other countries. The idea that any country in the African continent should have to de depend on wheat supplies from, from Russia and Ukraine is itself preposterous because wheat is not only uh, a, a, a staple crop that requires intensive uh, forms of agriculture that will actually deplete the soil, there are many other staple crops that, be, that can be planted on the continent, but they're dependent on wheat because in many cases, the paved roads for the purpose of delivering uh, foods such as nightshades, for example, you know, tubers like uh, sweet potatoes and yams, et cetera, cassava. Well, they have a limited shelf life. You can't store sweet potatoes in a silo the way that you would store grains in a silo. They will go bad very quickly. So they often spoil and then countries in Africa then depend on grain shipments from outside of the continent because they keep for a longer period of time. So half of the goods are spoiling before they even get to market. The second biggest barrier that did exist until last year was that uh, there were massive trade barriers between each of the countries. So if, uh, let's say, uh, Kenya was facing a food shortage crisis and then there was a surplus of uh, goods in Uganda that could be uh, ships to Kenya, well, one of the biggest obstacles was the trade barrier. Well, um, in 2021, January of 2021, um, all but one of the other countries on the African continent uh, engaged in a, a free trade pact. That is, uh, all of them are able to uh, move goods from one country to another without those, uh, those onerous trade barriers. Problem with that is, how do you actually get the goods from one country to another if you don't have railways and you don't have paved roads? So what's then required for, uh, to, to move goods from one place to the other is obviously to take out infrastructure loans. Well, when the IMF has already indicated that they will not offer you loans for the purpose of infrastructure, um, they will offer you loans for paying off your previously existing debts. And in exchange for that, they're going to require you to sell off your parastatal entities. So I'm thinking, for example, of a country like uh, Zambia. Zambia was one of the most, if not the most copper rich countries in the entire world. The issue with Zambia is that uh, during, the, uh, during the OPEC crisis of the 1970s, um, Zambia, along with countries uh, like uh, what was then called Zaire, uh, Ghana and other countries that were dependent on metal exports, well, their economies cratered because uh, no oil sales, no automobiles, uh, no planes being built, etc., no uh, transportation vehicles being built, well then no need for the metals that make up their bodies in the first place. So the problem was the export 
uh, markets for metals on the African continent absolutely collapse. And this is a situation from which many of these countries have never recovered. In order to qualify for those, uh, for those loans, Zambia was required, for example, to sell off its, uh, its public broadcaster, was required to sell off several hospitals, was required to partially privatize its education system. And every subsequent government that has tried to recover from this disaster in the, late, in the mid to late 1970s <clears throat> has not recovered since. Successive governments have not been able to overcome the onerous loan conditions and the repayment conditions that were uh, that were imposed on them by the original IMF loan. Right now, uh, Zambia is applying for and will likely receive another round of IMF loans, and the already stripped down to the bare bones government apparatus that exists now is going to have to further restructure itself in order to qualify for these loans. Why is it going back to the IMF? Well, apparently, Zambia was uh, trapped in a debt trap diplomatic relationship with China. And this is what many Western sources have been saying to casual viewers and readers and listeners that China is engaged in debt trap diplomacy with the African continent. Okay, okay so the question is, well, what, what does that mean? What is, what is China doing exactly? What, what are they doing on the continent? Well, I'm going to give you an example of another country that has actually been engaged in uh, heavy trade and financing with the African continent, and that's India. So the India uh, uh, Export and Import Bank, or the Exim Bank, um, between the years of 2009 and 2019, provided uh, $12.4 billion of transaction to Sub-Saharan Africa. And that was mostly for the purpose of uh, either infrastructure loans or <clears throat> repaying previously existing debts. China had roughly about five times that amount. And you know what China did not do during the course of the negotiations for these payments? Well, if you read uh, Financial Times or the, the Financial Post or foreign policy or the economists or any of these papers, they will say that these are all resource-backed loans, which, I mean, obviously, uh, usually if you take out a loan, there is some sort of a collateral that you will possibly put up. Now, the question is whether the financial entity that offers you the loan in exchange for this uh, or exchange for putting up of the collateral is actually going to seize that collateral. So we'll hear stories about, for example, China was planning on seizing a Ugandan airport or seizing the Kenyan airport or seizing Kenyan ports or all number of uh, scary uh, possible Chinese seizures of African infrastructure uh, projects that never ended up materializing. Well, why wouldn't they do that? Well, if you are a banking entity and you are known for uh, viciously seizing, like appropriating uh, the collateral. So let's say if you were a lender and somebody put up their home because they needed to redo their back decks or they needed to do their roofing or anything of that nature. So you take out, let's say, a ten or a $15,000 loan to do your home renovations, and you find yourself into some financial trouble. Let's say COVID hit. You're not able to pay back the, uh, the, uh, the line of credit on the schedule that you promised that you're going to. Well, I mean, unfortunately, many people were, were hit with, uh, with financial difficulties due to COVID. So what did banks do for the most part? Were they out seizing homes left, right, and center? No. The public, uh, the public opinion against those banks would have been detrimental. What they did instead was renegotiate the, lo the loan conditions, which is exactly what China did. Renegotiate the loan conditions, possibly offer additional financing if it was necessary, offer some loan forgiveness, or at least a holiday on repaying the principal until those countries could recover from COVID. Did this happen with Western countries? No. No, it didn't. At least I should say not for the most part. Did China renegotiate the loan conditions? Yes, they absolutely did. And now the, uh, the issue is that uh, for the most part, African countries have been increasingly turning to China and India in order to, uh, uh, to, to develop infrastructure, i.e. building roads and railroads so they can deliver not only goods domestically within the countries, but also in between the countries. So for example, one of the larger uh, projects that uh, is happening in, in Ghana right now is that there are two rail projects from uh, from Ghanaian ports to uh, the uh, the Burkina the capital of Bagadogu. There are multiple rail projects. There was a high speed rail project that was just completed in Nigeria. Another one uh, that is moving from Abuja uh, from the uh, from the nation's capital out to rural areas. Why? Well, for the purpose of delivering farm and agricultural goods and mineral goods to. Uh, the, uh, the the country's capital and the city centers. So the reason we've been hearing about this debt trap diplomacy is not only to demonize China, but also to infantilize African countries and say 
they should not be able to qualify for loans. They should not have any uh, sense of self-determination on their country's own development unless it's on our terms. And what they have to give up in exchange is not simply paying back the interest, but they should actually hand us their hospitals and public broadcasters. They should privatize their schools and they should let our agricultural products and our finished consumer products, our retail products, et cetera, we should be able to dump our surplus into their country and they should be able to say nothing about it. We should be able to dump our trash, dump our recycling into their countries and their environmental agencies can do absolutely nothing about it. As a matter of fact, why do they even have environmental agencies? Let's just dismantle those altogether. You just said uh, here's another under two minutes, Q. Sure thing. Now, here, here's here's uh, one final issue I want to get through um, in this. One of the uh, one of the largest complaints, which is an absolute lie, that I've seen, um, not only passed around by you know people on social media, et cetera, but also by uh, again those uh, those major uh, publications, uh, Financial Times, uh, the uh, uh, Foreign Policy Magazine, The Economist, et cetera, is that Chinese workers are actually displacing African workers. That is absolutely not true. The peak uh, of the peak amount of Chinese workers that were ever on the African continent was somewhere in the range of about 22,000 workers. And it's been decreasing steadily since 2017. Why? Because what was happening in countries like Ethiopia, for example, where some rail projects were being, uh, were, were, were being built is that uh, the conductors and also the engineers that were putting the tracks together, they needed fully trained experts to be able to embark on these projects. What they did in exchange was actually educate Ethiopian workers such that people who were uh, educated either in China or in Ethiopia um, that could take over these projects once they reached completion, when they were fully trained and then apprenticed, then Chinese workers would be able to return home and then the Ethiopian workers could be able to take on the projects by themselves. When that up happening, lo and behold, maybe the Chinese workers left. Chinese workers are increasingly leaving from countries like Nigeria and Ghana and Uganda and Ethiopia, et cetera. There's an increasing drawdown. What they've done is... Um, what was mentioned in a uh, report that I saw with uh, June Afrik just a couple of weeks ago, China wants to send scholars and engineers to Africa, i.e. educate their own. We are, we are not interested in sending guns to Africa. So the next time that you see somebody saying that the, uh, the African continent is being colonized by the Chinese or by anybody else, really, the, end, the, the, the immediate response that you probably want to come up with is, why is it that Africa cannot decide for itself? Thank you. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on this screen.